joy like you see in this picture. When was the last time that you had fun like this at work? When was the last time that you laughed until you cried or felt silly? We know that play is important for children, much like these tiny little building blocks that we have at our museum. When babies are playing, they're creating neural pathways and connections that build on each other and that allow them to develop. And we know that it's essential to children's cognitive development. Play develops coordination, balance, motor skills. It helps kids learn about their environment. It allows children to gain problem-solving skills, decision-making skills, makes them creative, critical thinkers. And let's be honest, we need more of that today. Children express themselves freely when they play. They experiment with different feelings and emotions and it teaches them how to regulate their emotions. Play teaches children how to interact with each other, just like you see in this picture. They negotiate and resolve conflicts together. And one of my favorite things about play is that it's intergenerational. It can evolve. Play becomes more complex as you grow up. And it bonds caregivers with their children. And play creates safe villages within communities. And that's a really important thing that we forget sometimes. Play makes families stronger. And we know that strong families make strong communities. And strong communities make this world a better place. So what would our community look like if we focused on the power of play for everybody? Not just a few people, not just people that can afford it, but everybody. So I have another question for you. When was the last time you got your hands dirty and you didn't care? And when was the last time you went outside as much as you wanted to and as much as you felt like you should? And when was the last time that you felt like you really had hobbies that you regularly did, that you enjoyed? It is okay if those questions make you feel a little uneasy. I'm not trying to guilt you up here. Um, just because you haven't focused on play lately in your personal grown-up life. But I want you to consider this as your call to action to change that. I want everybody here to be inspired to go home and tinker a little bit and be creative. Go do something silly. Go get together with friends and your loved ones. You don't need an itinerary, you just need to be. Find a way to laugh until you cannot stop and you just keep giggling and go use your imagination. Maybe go pretend for the first time in decades. I lead a children's museum and my conversations are always centered around why play is important for children. We know that. It's true more now than ever, especially because of the pandemic, because of a shifting climate in education that I know we're all watching, and because children are more stressed than they have ever been. But it is equally as important for you and every single grown up in this room as it is for the children exploring outer space in the USS Muse that you see here. Sports, chess, card games, hobbies, they bring you fulfillment and they help you relax, recharge, they help you explore what makes you happy. And play is a powerful tool that we just don't use quite enough. It benefits us from the time that we're born until the day that we die. And it's an essential aspect of human life that should not be overlooked. We need to start centering it into our daily routines and if we do, we're really gonna feel profound impacts on our well-being. I mean, look at this guy. He woke up and he said, I'm gonna go make sunglasses from scratch and it's gonna be awesome. At least that's what I imagine that he said when he came to our museum. So when you look at that and you think about what he got up saying, I want you to ask yourself, what are you gonna say when you wake up tomorrow? Will you do things that make you throw your hands up with joy? Are you gonna get out of your normal day today and do something a little outside of your comfort zone? Are you gonna giggle? Are you gonna feel silly? Are you gonna feel like a child again? I hope that you make space, get up, for the power of play in your life and in the lives around you. I want you to center fun and I want you to treat yourself with pure joy because you deserve it. You deserve to feel pure joy regularly and so, so much more. I encourage you to come see us at Muse Knoxville, see how we create transformative learning experiences through the power of play for everybody. And I wanna say thank you for hearing me out
tonight. My name is Allison Comer, and it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Allison, that was really great. I've had kids out on hikes before, and I remember I had one mom saying, he spends all his time in the basement, and he never comes out, and I can't get him to go outside. And with a half an hour, we were looking for animal tracks, we were looking for salamanders and critters. He was talking to me about um, the bears and the Smokies, and it was just really exciting. And then I had her, her mom um, write, you know, after I got that, it was transformed his whole life. Now he wants to go to camp, summer camp. He never is down in the basement anymore. And it's just heartwarming to see. So I moved out to the Pacific Northwest um, to about uh, 2001. And this is an early trip that I did. At this point, I already ditched my 75 um, liter Osprey pack. That was eight pounds and it was really weighing me down. And I started getting some lightweight gear and this is on the Olympic Peninsula. This was a, a 30 day trip that I did. Um, it was mostly off trail in the Sierra Nevada mountains. And we were doing orienteering by going up to these passes and taking the compasses out and looking at the maps. It was also a cooking trip and leadership, and it was a really exciting, good experience for me. Um, this is my buddy Matt from Ohio, and he made a pizza. And as soon as he brought over the new structures, they ate all of it. <laughs> um, but it was fun. We had to carry around um, this 85-pound pack, and by the end of the trip, I lost 19 pounds. As you can see, I'm pretty skinny, so I really didn't need to lose all that weight, but it was such a good experience for me. This is one of the groups I led out, the Pisgah. Um, I guided for a, a group that um, does interpretive guiding out in the Smokies. And uh, I've, get, I've guided people of all ages and all sizes, and it's really exciting to people light up out there and just be present. I um, also read ultralight gear. And um, as I started going to school for outdoor education, I started realizing, like, I don't know if people really need a guide with them all the time. So I started thinking more about the recipe with that, and I went into business courses, and I got a, um, a small grant, and I got some um, outdoor gear. And my thing was just to get people out doing more ultralight stuff. Um, I also work with um, map reading skills. Um, I always encourage people to bring a um, paper map instead of um, a phone because they could die, and just to be able to pull them out periodically. Um, um, just learning where um, water spot, um, spots are and places that you can camp is really important. Um, I'd like to teach people about backcountry skills. This is in between the South and Middle Sister. Um, over the years, I've done about 17,000 miles of backpacking for 20 years. Um, and that's just over 20 years, so I was going out all the time. Quite honestly, a lot of it was solo because I was obsessed. And my friends would go out with me, but I did it mostly on my own. Um, I like to teach people about um, snow skills. We would have winter camping classes and mountaineering classes in school, and I had three semesters of each of those. So we would learn crampon skills and how to self-arrest and all that. This is on the PCT um, going over high pass, which was a reroute. Uh, I like to tell people about bears because they're so afraid of them. Usually the first question I get from people are, is about bears on hikes. Um, and the bears here are small. You know, when they get human food, it's a big problem. This bear had two tags, and um, as me and my girlfriend were hiking along, he was kind of just moving on the side of the trail, and he made me nervous by the way he was acting. So I got him on his way. Um, another thing I like to do is because people are so excited about animals, there's so many good places out here to go see the animals, um, like wild horses in Grayson Highlands, for example. There's good loops you can come up with. Um, you can car camp. Um, this was actually a stone's throw away from the parking lot. Um, I like to do like more backcountry stuff, and Big Self work here is one of the most amazing places on the planet that I've been to for sure. There's over 200 arches and caves and waterfalls all over the place. A lot of them are off trail. Um, I, and I like to um, help people get out and do like more scrambling and kind of like, you know, what kind of mountaineering we can do here. And um, some people are comfortable at river crossings, other people aren't. Um, for example, Jack's River Trail on the Georgia border has 
over 35 river crossings. And some people are scared by that. So I like to help people figure out which one and what's comfortable for them as far as that goes. Because the Smokies has a lot of bridges, you know. And what good places to go swimming, you know. Um, summertime is a really good time to go out. Um, not mileage wise, but just focus on getting out there, being present, relaxing, going fine, swimming for a few hours. Well, this was March, so I was probably in there for like 10 minutes. Um, helping people figure out some places they haven't been, like um, Mount Rainier. Um, I've gone around all the Cascade Peaks that have um, trails. There's 11 of them. And this is um, looking at the Wonderland Trail. And the most interesting thing about this picture is if anyone's seen Mount Hood by Portland, is that little peak on the right hand side is actually bigger than Mount Hood. Um, a lot of people are excited about pioneers. Um, I'm not as big of a fan of human culture out there, but um, doing guiding, I've, I've done a lot of uh, historical tours, and I like to tell people um, the good places to go, um, maybe if they like to see people, some people are more comfortable being on their own, help figure out what's a good place for them. Or Cherokee culture, they used 300 plants out in the Smokies, so they really knew what they were doing out there. Um, this is a marker tree, and what they would do is they would take this tree when it was a sapling, and they would tie it down to the ground. And as time went on, it obviously grew a different way, and um, helped mark the trail. There's five different ways to look on. You don't have to take the busy Allen Cave way. There's other ways you can go to make better loops, in my opinion, um, like going down Bull's Head, and you can look back at Lacan from where you came. I think the Lacans are some of the better um, trails on the Smokies. If you're going to go up there for overnight or just during the day, what you can expect for different times of year. This is Needle's Eye in Big South Fork, just one of the many exciting caves. And if you were on top of this thing, you would not know this is underneath here. It's a, grassy ridge, doesn't even have any exposure. And you go around the corner and poof, has a big hole in there. And it kind of reminds me of that Eye of Sauron, right? <laughs> the Lord of the Rings. Oh, yeah. Um, I know all the good hiking trails. You obviously can't bring the dogs and the Smokies, but um, there's tons of good trails in North Carolina and Tennessee, Virginia, that have access. And there's better ones for dogs than other ones. And what good times of year to go out and see all the different flowers and which slope sides make more sense for that time of year. Fall colors are obviously awesome out here. And it's funny because a lot of people are like, oh, you know, Portland and all that Northwest is so beautiful. And it is. But out here we have so much diversity. There's 137 different kinds of trees in the Smokies. So when those start changing, the, the intricacies out there are just amazing. Thanks for your time. all day long. That all came to a hard stop when we moved to Valdosta, Georgia, and I started the first of 13 years of working remotely. During that time, I was fully employed and also became an entrepreneur, but one thing stayed the same. I worked at a desk in the laundry room all day every day with only my dogs to talk to. Turns out I hadn't just left offices behind, but community as well. Earlier this month, the U.S. Surgeon General released an advisory on the epidemic of loneliness and isolation. The advisory states, quote, the harmful consequences of a society that lacks social connection can be felt in our schools, workplaces, and civic organizations. Most folks who step out of a traditional in-person workplace face an almost immediate loss of their community. Those that are leaving the workforce to become an entrepreneur, they're starting a journey that is often defined by isolation, even though it's an experience in which community can be the most impactful support system. Lonely, bored, and craving connection, in 2019, I opened what was then known as Girl Boss Offices. The plan was simple, offer professional office space for women to run their business with the bonus of a built-in community of colleagues walking the same halls. Since then, and in part thanks to a global pandemic, we realized that while a physical location may be a fast way to create community, 
it's not the only way. Today, AUT defines community as a space, real or virtual, in which women support, learn, teach, motivate, encourage, and believe in each other and their businesses. Intentionally defining ourselves as a wider physical and virtual community and purposefully inviting others in has had a pretty positive ripple effect. We have women who've become best friends, business partners, clients. They've walked through motherhood challenges and professional trials together. They embody the idea of community and collaboration over competition. Since our doors opened, I've been lucky enough daily to hear stories of how aught has played a role or been a thread in a story. These stories fuel us towards our purpose of changing lives in local communities through female entrepreneurship, and I'd like to share a few of them with you. This is Kristen and Erin. They both came to us as solopreneurs running account agencies. They'd never met before, but instead of coming into it and seeing each other as competition, they decided to form a relationship of collaboration. Today, they refer clients to each other regularly and call each other best friends for life, and each has grown from a solopreneur to a CEO with a full team. This is a photo of some pretty awesome women, some members, some just friends of all across the U.S. who came together to help us when we needed to rename our business. Their willingness to help and their belief in what we were doing led us to think maybe we should be doing, making a community that was a little bit larger than just a physical space. And this is Jade. She came to us as a full-time nurse with a side gig providing lactation consultant services. She says she knew a lot about feeding babies but not about running a business. And she credits Ott for teaching her business knowledge and also expanding her business so much that she's had a thousand percent increase and now sees almost 80 percent families, 80 families per month. This smiling lady's in the audience, Hannah. She owns an online gifting service. We love watching her lean into community while culting her business throughout the country. She doesn't like being on camera, but she does it a lot now for a whole bunch of people on their social platforms. And then last, Ott has had the opportunity of participating as a mentor and hosting an all-female team for the last two rounds of What's the Big Idea? My young daughter, who you see, has also participated and experienced community firsthand. She was able to watch women working together toward a common goal for another woman not for personal or professional gain. Both Big Idea founders entered this experience without knowing most of their team members. By the end, they both were part of a new community. And the best part is, these two group photos show an overlap of already existing communities. Women in Entrepreneurship, Let Her Speak, the Women of Knoxville, and a lot. I know I'm making it sound easy, but in reality, most of us in this room probably feel like outsiders a lot of the time. But if everyone feels like an outsider, then everyone can also feel like an insider. If we know that the best way to make us feel welcome is to be invited, then we have a responsibility to do some inviting. Since starting on, I've heard one core message from every first conversation that I've spoken with. Everyone is looking for community. When I tell them communities exist, they light up. When I tell them I can introduce them to a community, they lean in. And when I follow through with opening the door to a community, they walk through it. Once they walk through the door, though, the responsibility should not be on them to find their place. The community should take on the burden of awkwardness and do away with the long-held narrative of every woman for themselves, sink or swim. So how do we get the definition of community right? How do we build community where it didn't exist before? And if you're going to call your group a community, how are you going to live that out in the reality of day to day as new people make their way in? Do you wait for people to find you? Wait for them to ask to be invited? Wait for them to knock on the door? Or do you extend a gracious and meaningful invitation? One where you not only hold the door open, but lead them through the door and stick with them so they are not in the corner with their cell phone or hanging at the charcuterie board because there's no one to talk to. Will you and other members of your community take the hard step of saying the first hello, asking questions that matter instead of standard small talk, and saying the most important phrase, we're glad you're here. Cultivating community is a learning curve. There's no classroom instruction. It's a hands-on laboratory with success and failures. But when I look at the lives that can be changed, the relationships that have flourished, and the community that exists where it didn't before, I know it's worth it. Community wins every time. way easier, but also what's way easier is that I can tell you a lot about my 
myself, I can tell you a lot about myself with just a photo. I am a lawyer, I've got degrees that are kind of fancy. I drew that painting, or I made that painting in high school. I'm a part of Big Ears, I've got a patent, I've got all this weird stuff, self-taught coder, and I got asked to speak at the TEDx conference at UT, which was really cool, yeah! It was really cool because it forced me to think about this one secret thing that I've been holding on to all my life. What? What? And I don't know what that was. So the, the context of it was, is that this was me giving a code talk, a code stock many years ago. And it was here that, this is like one example, this isn't where I learned everything, but it was one example of how I figured out how to dial myself in, or how much do I not? And it was weird because I never like presented to coders. This is one of my daughters, I have twin daughters, and this is meant to show you guys that big things happen to us, like twins, and you learn from them. But it's the small actions, the small things in life that you get to decide what you do, where it shifts your life. Now, let me draw you something. We have the known things that we know, okay? That's the things that we know about ourselves, maybe, to a certain degree. Then we have things that we don't know coming up, right? I rehearsed this so perfectly, so perfectly. It's a little jagged, you don't know where the boundaries are, and it's a little fuzzy. And that might be, how do people react to us, you know, right? How much do we know about the situation? How much do we know even about our own family? The difference between what we know and what we don't know is fear. That's what fear is. When we think we know what we know, and then we're met with the reality that we don't. And let me tell you what, I figured that out real quick with twins. <laughs> but what we do, we can build a bridge. And how we build a bridge is by small things that we do every day. And if we do that right, we can actually cross the fear and there's no problem. We can go back to what we know, back to what we don't know, and that's how we grow. That's how we evolve, right? So what am I getting to here? So I think this is the framework that I've operated all my life, and I've got, like, I feel like I'm a winner, but it's small wins. Like, I'm not, I haven't got the big wins, but I feel like I've got a small wins, right? But these two have just catapulted our life into big wins, and I think we can have our cake and eat it too. If we do all of this and we acknowledge the fear that we can cross with our actions, we get to figure out our identity. That's my last name, Koreshi, and it's spelled out with some kid blocks that my wife made. She bears that name with so much pride. Our last name are Koreshi. It's, it's Koreshi, and it's, it's crazy that there's so much value to our family. If you do this, you can also find happiness. Now, there's two types of happiness that you can see. This is my other, well, actually, oh man, I'm picking on Anna. This is still Sylvie. It's gonna give me complex. So, Sylvie's super happy, and I'm carrying her at the zoo, but she could be happy, but I could be happy realizing that moment is happening. And the third thing you can get while deploying action greater than your fear is energy. A lot of you kind of know me from the Triple P pandemic stuff. I helped a lot of businesses raise a lot of money. There's it was out there. And I would just spend a numerous amount of energy just reading actual Senate bills before it actually became law. So I don't know how the energy. Now, if you don't do this, if you don't implement it, I mean, there's still ways to get it wrong if you, if you do. If you don't, you're totally you know, missing the boat. And I missed the boat with my first startup. So I failed as an entrepreneur. At least this is my chapter of failure. This was audio hand. The concept was we have different uh, phones recording a show and stitches it together. You know, when I was doing all this stuff, look at that. I have a Beamer, I'm on the front of a newspaper, I'm important, making a presentation, but it was all the small things that I shouldn't have been worrying about, and I shouldn't have been putting any energy on. It was all a distraction. You see, I was focused on all the little things so much that no matter what actions I deployed day by day, nothing moved the needle, nothing. You can deploy this framework wrong. It's by accepting the wrong fear. And so, here's something that I've done right with my life. Twins and fathering. 
I think I am just crushing it, even though today was a punch in the face. <laughs> face. Thank you, Abriana Kate Koreshi, Sylvia Ren Koreshi. Abriana Kate, Anna Kate, and Sylvia Ren, and they're amazing. This is their car seats in my car, and I want you guys to see this. There's two of everything, because we hate sharing. <laughs> two of everything. Yeah, I went back to the zoo and got an extra flamingo and giraffe, by the way. <laughs> But they're cozy, they've got books, we don't have any screens. And we try to make sure that they enjoy music. And you hope that they're raising them the right way. You hope that the thing you're investing in, you're not screwing it up. And so when we see little moments like this, we know that we're doing it right. We know that we're figuring it out. But it doesn't mean there aren't any scary moments. And this is what I call everyday courage. The moment that you can look a moment in the eye, or face the moment, and know that your actions have to outkick that difference between what you know and what you don't. And that realization in the moment is what leads you to the promised land, where you get to have all the happiness, all the energy, and you get to know who the hell you are every given day. Thank you. Sometimes with exotic names. 
people want to debate our ability to go into a bathroom, but they don't want to talk about, you know, the, the violence that we potentially face in a bathroom. They don't want to talk about being assaulted, uh, us you know, trans people being assaulted in the bathroom. They don't want to talk about the fact that every time I go to a bathroom, I have to brace myself to get punched or to get harmed. Uh, dating, 12%, only 12% of people are willing to date a trans person. Um, and you can see here, uh, we, we get some really interesting, terrible messages um, and also a lot of ghosts. I've been very fortunate, this is my wonderful partner, Chris. Um, I've been very fortunate to find somebody who loves me for me and not because I am trans or in spite of the fact that I'm trans. Um, he tells me all the time I'm beautiful. Um, blue for that. Come on, you can at least pretend to agree with him. Uh, people are very comfortable debating my validity as a trans person. People are very comfortable continuing to support somebody uh, say they're allies and then continuing to support people like J.K. Rowling and Dave Chappelle who want to debate my validity and say horrible, horrible things about me. But this is where, this is where we diverge. People are always talking about our, you know, transition and our, the, the horrible things that happen to us, but we find community with each other. Um, and that has been life-saving, that's been amazing. We find ourselves more authentic and being loved because of this. These were my kids. I was I was a teacher, and they loved me more after I transitioned because they were like, "Oh, okay, this is who you really are. You're being authentic now. Cool, cool, cool." <laughs> yeah. And all the amazing allies. Um, when you get to be who you are, and the people around you love you and support you for it. It's just so freeing and so amazing. Um, but we're under attack. And this is my ask of any of you who support tra trans people, want to support trans people, please, we need you to speak up. Especially cis, straight, or cis, straight, white men we need your voices. Yes. It's unfortunate that it's like that, but we do need your voices. Um, I wish we could talk more about trans joy, um, but I do feel very much uh, like we are in a genocide right now, so trans joy is gonna have to be something that is still happening, but maybe we just don't get to talk about it as much right now. So, uh, This is, this is just where we're at. I, I, I don't remember what I was supposed to say for this slide, honestly. That ADHD is kicking my butt right now. I had something really inspiring, just know that. Uh, oh, so here was my call to action. So just, we're gonna, we're gonna move that call to action earlier to this, to this slide, yeah. Cis, white, straight men, I need y'all to like get on it, okay? If you need to know what to say, ask a trans person, we'll help you. And of course, last but not least, I think this is the last slide, God help me. Nope, it's not. It's not at all. Yup. I have adopted this attitude though. Yeah, you can choke. If you don't like it, you can choke, so. Um, this I think is about just being visible. Um, I, I can't not be visible. And here's my shameless plug, there we go. If you wanna see some trans excellence, if you want to support trans people, you are all invited to attend the Miss Tennessee Continental Pageant on Sunday at the Crown Course. Woo, yeah. Um, this is drag excellence, and this particular system is, uh, has always been very trans friendly, so uh, please come and support us if you'd like to. Thank you. Y'all give it up for story one more time. Yes! Make me feel good. You can choke. Oh man, I need to keep that. I need to keep that. Alright, I'm ready. My name is Jasmine Newton, and I'm the owner and portrait photographer of Javon Renee Portraits. 
Tonight I want to share with you the transformative power of portraits, how they've helped me embrace my worth, and how, I, how they help others do the same. Portraits are my jam, y'all, and I'm about to take y'all on a beautiful ride. I have a passion for empowering women through branding and legacy portraits. My work goes beyond capturing moments. It's about uncovering inner strength, preserving personal stories, fostering self-love, and elevating who you are. But before I could do this work, I had to do it for myself. Growing up, yeah, I was cute. <laughs> I didn't always feel valued or worthy. As I learned about kingdoms, dynasties, and heroes and other cultures in school, my history was barely taught, neglecting the rich tapestry of my African roots. I felt unseen, unrepresented, and void. And I, allow me to introduce you to Lillian, my great-grandmother. When my grandmother showed me this photo of her mother, it was a, transform a transformative moment for me. I saw the strength and resilience in her eyes as well as the sadness. It was a defining moment that ignited my curiosity about my family's past and helped me see who I am and the strength I come from. My grandmother created many photo albums and showed them to me. I realized the significance of portraits and the stories they hold. They were gateways to my family history and later to myself. They made me realize the power of knowing where you come from and how far you've come. My family beautiful, y'all. As a luxury portrait photographer, I work to create powerful portraits all the time. Through my lens, I empower women to see their worth, embrace their unique beauty, and express their authenticity. It's not about capturing an image. It's about creating an experience that leaves a lasting impact. It is my intention to celebrate your inner beauty. I firmly believe that the true beauty shines when we embrace our uniqueness and show the world who we truly are, our own unique brand of beauty. I want you to really see yourself for the first time or for the first time in a long time. Portraits go beyond capturing the present moment. They allow us to leave a lasting heritage for future generations. Your portrait becomes a bridge connecting your descendants to you and your story. It's a window through which they can understand their roots and help shape their identity. Like Lillian's portrait did for me, your portrait's purpose is bigger than you. Portraits have the power to tell timeless stories. They freeze moments, capture emotions, and the essence of you. These portraits become treasures that speak volumes about our journey, our growth, and the connections we hold dear. Through portraits, we show the chapters of our lives. Representation matters, period. I strive to promote diversity, inclusivity, and empowerment. When people from all backgrounds see themselves reflected in art, it ignites a sense of belonging, understanding, and pride. And when we celebrate diverse stories, we create a collective narrative that embraces and uplifts everyone. Portraits can be a journey of self-discovery. We peel back layers, reveal inner strength, beauty, and authenticity that may have been hidden or overlooked. People sometimes tell me, I've never seen myself like this. And to this I reply, I'm gonna need you to open your eyes and start seeing exactly who the hell you are. <laughs> Self-love lies at the core of my work. I empower people to embrace their true selves, to love and appreciate every aspect of who they are, flaws and all. I remind them that they are deserving of love, respect, and recognition. I don't care who you are. You deserve a portrait of yourself. You are literal freaking art. Portraits can also speak to your personal identity. By embracing and showcasing your unique qualities, we create portraits that reflect your true essence. These portraits become affirmations of your identity, reminding us all to embrace our individuality and celebrate what makes us unique. Family. It's the foundation of our lives, and I believe in preserving the bonds that tie us together. These portraits capture the love, promises, hope, connections, and memories. They serve as reminders of the importance of family and the enduring strength of our bonds with other beautiful souls during our lifetimes. From new births to those golden years of wisdom, each moment deserves to be documented and celebrated. They all hold significance. Portraits are reminders of our journey, our milestones, and they inspire us to keep telling our stories as we walk through life. Our cultural heritage is a source of pride and strength for all of us. 
Telling our stories helps us celebrate our roots and revive the traditions that have shaped us. By preserving our cultural heritage through portraits, we honor our ancestors and pass on their legacy to future generations. I love to capture raw emotions and vulnerability, the essence of a person. Each portrait becomes a window into someone's life, inviting you to connect on a deeper level and hopefully start conversations, bridge gaps, break down barriers, and cultivate a more compassionate society. Listen, it's time to stop being afraid to connect the dots between history and our personal stories. When we teach our full history, including all perspectives, portraits play a key role in visually showcasing beauty, struggle, pain, redemption, and the lessons. They become windows into different worlds that show our differences as well as our similarities in our shared humanity. Portraits have the ability to transcend time, outliving you and me, becoming treasured heirlooms for future generations as we capture and preserve our stories through portraits. We create a lasting legacy, allowing our descendants to know their history, understand their roots, and shape their own destinies. In conclusion, just as we inherit physical traits from our ancestors, we also inherit their stories, their strength, and their unwavering spirit. Through portraits, we embrace the legacy, passing it on to future generations. These images become more than mere photographs. They become symbols of our interconnectedness, reminding us to honor our heritage, celebrate our diversity, and continue the legacy of love and resilience for generations to come. They become the thing that can create that transformative moment for your son, your niece, or even your great-granddaughter to finally see exactly who the hell they are and how powerful they are and how amazing it can be to continue the legacy by existing in portraits and continuing the amazing story called life. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I am Amelia Galvis. actually is an art that has sort of fallen to the wayside. And I knew nothing of brooms coming from the north, where they came from or where they're made. I was fortunate enough to make, meet a broom maker, and because the entire craft is hearsay, um, he asked me to take an entrepreneurship, which I did. And since then, I have been making a lot of brooms. And I didn't realize what I was getting into. Um, it was supposed to be sort of like a lark, I used to be an art teacher. What the heck does an art teacher do after teaching art? Super question. Nobody seems to know. I made brooms. So it has taken me to some pretty cool places that I would have never thought of going to in a million years. Here I am at the Museum of Appalachia. Um, I demonstrate in front of the Broom and Rope House. And uh, it's been really wild. Everybody has a broom story, you guys. Um, I learned how to dye them and I really like the curvy sticks. And my teacher is very much an old codgery heritage crafter and was not thrilled with that at all. But Gen X, we need sexy brooms. I'm bringing you some sexy brooms, guys. <laughs> um, I've had them up in some galleries, which again is super wild. This was supposed to be a lark and um, everybody sweeps. I don't know if you guys knew that. Um, I guess I didn't realize that until I started making brooms. Um, so these were kind of fun. I actually got a little, lot of feedback about these. They were on Gay Street for a while. Um, okay, so when I started it, I didn't want to be a fraud. I'm an old art teacher and thought this has to be a giant performance piece. That's the only way I'm going to make it in the art world, right? So Dogwood Festival now deems me as an artist. Um, I made my logo. And the flying feature not included saves me from a lot of mother-in-law slash ex-wife jokes. <laughs> um, also, fireplace brooms. Nobody thinks about them. I never thought about them, but check out your fireplace broom. Somebody made that. Um, I've met maybe four blacksmiths now, and I've made a lot of fireplace brooms. And I just think about where they go. It's really super cool, actually. So, I mentioned I can dye them, and I like to play with the, the broom corn, which is what brooms are made out of. 
And that I see as sculpture. And as an artist, that absolutely got me from the beginning. They are functional pieces of art, and they have a mind of their own. So here they are, again, mind of their own. They kind of take me wherever they lead me. And we have been on the news a few times, talking about brooms. The interesting thing, and I know I keep saying that, but it's so mind-boggling that they're brooms, and so many people are so confused that they're brooms. They sweep, I mean, that's what they do, but they're also gorgeous. And the neat thing is, is that they can be made out of anything. In this picture, they're being made out of basket re re reeds, sorry. Um, and if I can drill a hole in it, and if I can move it, I can make a broom out of it, which has led to some very interesting brooms recently. The brooms have taken me to Berea, um, the broom shop where, because we are such a small group, I know there's a lot of broom makers, but it's, it's not as large as potters or jewelry. It's kind of neat, because we all kind of run kind of together. Um, it's a big community. So we're always sort of pushing each other to do something more interesting. How do you, again, how do you make a broom sexy? So I like the twisty branches. We are not straight. Your broom should not be straight. It's a better sweep. That's a little pro tip for you. And we can die the heck out of them. But the cool thing is, is that my brooms have made it to six countries. I'm in 48 states. Um, and the brooms have touched people that I would never in a million years think that they would even second, take a second guess about brooms. Um, here's some brooms in New York, and my friends actually attended the broom class. Now the broom classes are bizarre, you guys, because I thought that it was just going to be a bunch of moldy heritage crafters hanging out and like doing some heritage craft stuff. That is not the case. Every walk of life comes to these broom classes, and because it's like bread, I mean, well, some of us don't eat bread anymore, but everybody comes to the classes, and everybody has sticks, you guys. It doesn't matter where I am. This guy's bringing me sticks. I was at the Tino Festival, and he said, I've got sticks, and I thought, what? There he is. It was a bunch of cedar. It was gorgeous. Maybe some of you have seen them at the farmer's market. Also, um, parking lots of parks and museums where people's children take the sticks and hit them against trees. So when you tell them to drop them after they, before they get into the car, that's where I come in. <laughs> so these are already marked. There are no bugs, except for the brave ones. Um, and they'll take anything. So these are chair spindles. And a friend of mine came to market and told me that this perilous story about how she saved these chair spindles from a bonfire. And she actually ran to get them out of the guy's hands. If you knew my friend, this, it makes the story way more hilarious. So this is another way that you can make brooms. I use a stick and string in my feet, which is the traditional way of making brooms. This is called a kick winder. It's from the 1890s. Uh, colleague of mine could not uh, fix it the way that she wanted to, and now it's mine. Hey, if anybody knows how to fix a broom winder, let me know. <laughs> um, I do a lot of stuff with communities. I go to schools. I teach them about brooms and handmade brooms. And the goats are always the first guys to come up, usually at these things, to see if they can eat the brooms. Um, it is inedible. It's called broom corn. It's a cousin of sorghum, and it didn't get the edible part. All in all, I'm super happy that the brooms found me, or I found the brooms. They have taken me to wonderful places. I feel like they're bringing communities together. Everybody has a broom story, and grandparents are telling grandchildren things that they wouldn't normally tell them. It's interesting seeing people put their phones down to hear the broom stories. Anyway, thank you very much, and have a nice time. Hi, friends. How are you? So we're going on an emotional roller coaster. Do you mind if I join you? Coming down, baby. I, I want to take this ride with you all, so we're just going to do this together. All right, here we are. I think I'm ready. Not really, but we're ready. Five, four, three, two, one. The roller coaster, the staple of any amusement park. A marvel of engineering, my love language, and most people's fears. Tonight, I want to take a satirical look at some of the elements of a roller coaster 
and loosely connect them to the fears of our everyday lives. But first, let's see how we got here. I have always had a passion for roller coasters. Some would say an addiction, but I say a passion. As a kid, I would watch VHS tapes every night, two of them, America's Greatest Coasters and America's Greatest Coasters 2. <laughs> the sequel was really great. I kept a fuller uh, coaster blueprints that I created. Roller Coaster Tycoon was my shit. It still is. Um, <laughs> from building coasters with Kinects to pulling my sister in a red wagon, uh, the science behind coasters has always interested me. So much that I decided to make a future about it. After writing a letter to my favorite roller coaster designer, which I know we all have one, uh, I came to UT to pursue a double major of mechanical and civil engineering in hopes of becoming a coaster designer. And that lasted about two semesters. So that brings us to today. I still study coasters the way people study football. I travel to theme parks the way people travel to Taylor Swift. So this is obviously certifying me to talk to you tonight about the emotions behind a roller coaster. I'm not a doctor, just a season pass holder. So, when the gates open, please proceed to the next seat, secure all the lease articles, finish your drinks, fasten your seatbelt for sight, uh, pull down your restraint, and prepare to launch. Please keep all legs and arms inside the train at all times, and enjoy your ride. <laughs> Like the dreaded train lift. We are riding up 325 feet to the tallest coaster in America. This is Fury 325 at Carowinds, located in Charlotte, which is just as tall as the first Horizon building downtown. This is probably my favorite coaster, the speed, the quick transitions, the giant trot, but that fucking lift hill. The lift hill is the worst part of a coaster for me. I'm silent, my eyes are closed, I'm counting every second until we crest that hill. Although I love coasters, this part makes me question my love every time. <laughs> what if we stop? Why does it take so long? What if I don't make it to the top? These are the same emotions I have about my personal climb to the top. What if my climb stops or it slows down? Why can't I just be there? And why? Uh, what if I start to roll back? Which actually can't happen because like clicking sound, that's like a safety mechanism, but it's like, like that's a nerd thing. So I know that I'm safe, I'm just afraid the fun will stop and I'll have to leave the ride, and that part scares me. On the coaster, and also in life. Just get me to the top already, I've been waiting too long, let's get this ride started. Once I hit the top though, it's on, eyes are open, mouth is open, curse words are spewing. I'm no longer in charge, and I'm on top of the world, literally and figuratively. The drop. That empty feeling in the stomach, the weightlessness. Here we are hanging off the edge of Shigra at Busch Gardens, Tampa, America's first dive coaster, which is famous for hanging riders over the 200-foot drop for multiple seconds before plunging them down 90 degrees at 70 miles an hour. Some people are cringing already. This is the feeling dreams are made of. I love that feeling, the adrenaline floating out of your seat and the heart in your throat. So much that it's now how I measure a first date, that weightless, breathtaking, out-of-body feeling. I'm gonna go for the ride. <laughs> Never mind. Anyway, sorry, the roller coaster. A lot of us can't take this. Why? The feeling of being out of control, the feeling of falling and failing to make it back up. I want everyone to know, no matter how big your drop, you'll get back up. You will rise back up and crest that next hill. Just like a coaster, use that energy and inertia from the first drop and push yourself up back to the next hurdle. But after that first drop, there's always a loop. The classic teardrop loop, the corkscrew, the Emmelman, the Colbert Pro, the heartline roll, or maybe a diving loop, just you know, to name a few. <laughs> Thank you. It flips us around, presses us against the seat, making us feeling disoriented, all while snaking through the winding track. Sometimes these are quick flips, sometimes these are slow and controlled. Either way, I'll blow me some rotations. Right now, we are soaring through the first loop on the Wild Eagle at Dollywood, America's first wing coaster. A style of train that seats riders on the side of the track with nothing above or below you, a true flying sensation. If the thought of loops or flips concerns you, let's explore that. Are you the type of person that likes to be in control of all your situations? Always a plan of action and sticks to it? You know where you're going in life and hate when an obstacle changes your direction? Here's my advice. Enjoy the ride. You may see life differently, especially when you're upside down at 100 feet in the air. All of this couldn't happen with the cuddling power of restraints. 
whether it's a lap bar or the shoulder harness or what we see here, the clamshell, you are supported, whether you like to think so or not. The restraints have a backup plan to the backup plan if they were ever to fail. Does anyone not trust these things? <laughs> so stop thinking you aren't supported. You are, my friend. You are safe. Nobody's out to get you, and your systems won't fail. Don't let your trust issues hinder you from having a good time, or making that next move, or enjoying life's ride. Roller coasters are emotional to me. That's why I love sharing them with friends and family. A friend recently said, after sitting on a coaster with me, why do I let you talk me into this shit? <laughs> At this time, I made it some silly remark, but honestly, it was because I love roller coasters so much, and I want to have people around me when I'm at my most joyful, and when I can make new memories with them. This coaster right here is the Loch Ness Monster at Busch Gardens Williamsburg. It's a core memory for me. It was my first looping coaster, and I rode it with my dad in 1995, the year before he died. Its interlocking loops were at first of its kind, and to this day, it's the only coaster with interlocking loops, and I want to say for a good reason. So I hope you feel safer taking on a ride on a coaster, and maybe even trying a different track in life. We have to end our ride. When this train comes to a full and complete stop, lift up on your restraints and exit to the left. Thank you for riding my emotional roller coaster here at Pachaka Cha and enjoy the rest of your night here.